Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, the Executive Director here at the Colorado Railroad Museum, and I am welcoming you to this week's edition of our Friday Tour Virtual. And today we're going to do something a little different. Rather than wandering around our rail yard to show you several different cars, we're going to focus on one, and I thought it would be a great start to a virtual program to go back to something that is as simple as a scale test car. Let's start with the scale itself because this means that railroads and all kinds of other industrial installations are going to have to have a scale nearby so that the railroad cars coming from those destinations or from those origin points can be weighed and then be sent off to their destinations. So as things would evolve, many different grain elevators and industrial um, sites, if they shipped a lot of cars, or of course many railroad yards, would have to have a scale installed. And there was an entire switching crew devoted to the idea of shoving freight cars across that scale, one at a time, to weigh them, to find out what is, what is the weight of this car so that we can bill it. Well, that means that all of those scales have got to have a standardized way of being built, functioning, and how do you test them to make sure that the scale is actually weighing the proper weight. First, let's look at the scale installations. There's a box where the operator actually sits off to one side, uh, and there are actually four rails, as you'll notice, in the ground. Now, this is a quirk of the scale because the scale itself has two of those rails. In this case, we're dealing with a standard gauge uh, railroad piece of equipment, so a narrow gauge looked the same, it's just not quite as wide. Um, Two of those rails are the rails that you would push the loaded railroad car onto for weighing. Two of those are what are called a bypass rail because you would not send a locomotive over the scale. It tended to uh, invalidate the proper functioning of the scale because locomotives are much heavier than railroad cars and you can't, at least at the time for the technology, you couldn't set up a scale that would weigh things that were in the, you know, 60 to 100,000 range and then also not break when it was run over by things in the two to 300,000 pound range rather. So it just had to do with send the locomotives around the scale, put the freight cars through the scale, but essentially once you put the freight car on, the scale depresses inside that box. There's a weight device with one of those little arms with um, uh, weights on it and of course the operator as you went back earlier in time you added on more little weights to get it to balance and then you could tell what the weight was. As time went on this technology got a little bit more advanced uh, but mm, not terribly much. In modern railroading we've changed how we weigh and how we bill and how rates are set so by the 1980s this concept went out of business and so this scale test car right here was actually donated to the Colorado Railroad Museum in 1980. Um, but let's now talk a little bit about it, because this is a railroad car that has got a whole heck of a lot of history under its belt. This car is Western Weighing and Inspection Bureau number 910. As you can see, it's set up to have a weight pretty much exact, certainly within about 100 pounds, of 39,000 pounds. So when you rolled this thing onto the scale, somewhere on the system that this was set up to inspect, you wanted the scale to weigh 39, to know that it weighed 39,000 pounds, and if it didn't, well, something was wrong and you had to recalibrate your scale. This car actually dates back to about 1890, and it was first built for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway. And at that time, it had a much longer number on the Santa Fe in maintenance of way. It may have been built it with a different number. Something like this might have changed numbers and owners. Certainly, it kept being bounced around on the system, built, rebuilt, fixed, 
repaired, modified. This car has all of that kind of history to it. But it was originally built as Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. What we have on record is 199910. So when it was sold in the early 1930s to the Western Weighing and Inspection Bureau, they simply kept the last three numbers. And pretty much everything else stayed the same so far as we know in the record. So, how does this car work? How is it built? Well, it's actually what appears to be a two-part casting. So think of solid iron. This part here, you can see a seam right in the middle. And there's another identical casting, and they were stuck together. And there's a hollow area here. Because think about it, you're building castings, you want this to add up to exactly 39,000 pounds, but over time as things get repaired, added to it, maybe they had to add the hand railing for safety at some point, the weight's going to change. So what you have to have in this middle area is the ability to add and subtract smaller amounts of weight to get you to that 39,000 pound exact rolling paperweight sort of thing. So, it's a pretty simple item. As we continue our tour, I'm going to show you though, this is a car that probably got banged around a whole lot. It's gone through many changes over the years. One of the most fascinating, if you think about it from a railway perspective, is this little odd barcode thing here. Well, that's clearly added um, probably about in the 1970s, towards the very end of this car's life. And that's uh, an early form of railway barcoding where electronic readers that were track side uh, in the railway environment were employed to try and keep track of where railway cars were. And that particular technology didn't work nearly as well as some of the forms that we've become used to now, but you could see those little odd uh, colored bars on railroad cars all through the 70s and into the 80s uh, until we replaced it with another technology. But that didn't come until way late in this, this, this car had a 90 year roughly service life and all through that time it did the same job. First working for the Santa Fe and then working for Western Weight. So other things that would have changed over time, of course bearings, axles, wheels, the pedestals that these are in, all of these things are wear points on a railway vehicle, so they would have worn out. So they had to get replaced. And probably the castings on this car are original, but I wouldn't be surprised to know that many of the other parts, if not most of the other parts, don't go back to 1890, because that's just how these things work in the railway environment. You typically had to replace springs at some point. If there was ever an accident that this car might have gotten involved in, and we'll talk about that in a moment, then probably other bigger parts on this might have had to get repaired. We don't have any records of known accidents to this car, but just in taking a look at it and knowing a little bit about its function, it probably had its share. Think about it. With a car like this, where do you put it in a train? Well, it was specified in the, uh, the regulations that I've been able to look through that typically a car like this was handled at the end of a train, uh, typically right ahead of the caboose, but behind everything else. This car's not really made for pulling, so you don't want to pull a whole lot of weight through it. Um, and it's kind of an odd little thing, and so you don't want it to be mixed up in the middle of a train if that train's going for any distance and might have any slack action issues associated with it, because this car is going to perform very differently uh, in train service, plus braking on a car like this is going to be completely weird. Who knows whether it had air brakes when it was first built? There's clearly a hole in the casting, so I'm going to uh, venture that probably it was built with that in mind because it would be kind of hard to put a hole in a solid casting. Um, it, of course, would have been built with handbrakes regardless because 
that's essentially your parking brake in a railroad environment. So you've got to make sure that this is a functioning brake so you can tie the car down, as is, as is said in our terminology. It's got the standard coupler where uh, we have part of the, the lever is, is a different assembly where it's internal and we've got the chain missing here right now, but it works just like any other coupler. Um, so there's nothing all that unusual about it. I say the hand railing may go back to the very beginning. It would certainly be easier on crews to use this device if the hand railing was always there. But who knows, early in railroading, uh, that wasn't always um, a top of the mind uh, thought was how to make it easy for the crew to use the uh, particular car. And then these boxes have been uh, clearly added to be able to probably put chains and other things in. It may have been necessary to um, occasionally do some kind of an unusual switching move. Plus, uh, this car might have been pulled into position from an adjacent track on occasion. Uh, notice these pockets, which again are another standard railroad item, but not used at all today. It used to be that you could put a big wooden stick in between this car and a locomotive on an adjacent track and then push this car from one track over into another. Kind of a dangerous practice because if the pole fell out or splintered or any number of other things that could go wrong, you had a tendency for whoever was working with the pole, the brakeman, to get hurt. So that polling was, was outlawed in railroads um, and, and so that, that wouldn't have gotten used. But well, during the time that that was usable, you had to have a place to put the pole and other things that were, were built to support this. So those were added. And uh, like I say, as, you, as we walk around this car, let's come to the other end. And notice on this end, there's been some interesting surgery performed, which probably suggests again with a solid iron casting that um, something went wrong here. Uh, who knows what that was, but this is a big enough chunk that perhaps it, uh, perhaps it got switched such that another coupler came and struck here and shattered some of the iron or some kind of a misfortune happened at this end. Again, not all that unusual for something that was 90 years old and kind of got moved around the way a car like this would. So that's today's tour of a car that you may not have even known existed in railway service representing a kind of aspect to railroading we just don't think about today. And we're going to be looking forward to bringing you some more of these unusual items around the railway yard here at the Colorado Railroad Museum in weeks to come, along with things that you might be more familiar with, because the railroading environment is a big one. Thank you.